Project. I'm Marie Ennis O'Connor. I'm a patient advocate. I'm a breast cancer survivor. And I like to say, well, I don't really like to say it. Nobody likes to say that cancer is their introduction to anything. But cancer was my introduction to patient advocacy. And then the internet was my entry into a whole new world of online peer-to-peer -peer education and support. And one of the most exciting things that I have witnessed over the past decade, and thankfully it's over a decade since I was diagnosed with breast cancer, is the way in which online networks are emerging as a new medical domain within which the patient sits at the center and with the potential to truly transform healthcare. So if you could switch to my slides, please, that would be wonderful. Um, what I want to talk about is the potential to partner with patients, which I had just listened into the last talk there um, of Greg Simon. And I think this is where we're going to be talking a lot about. It's the partnership with patients that are going to achieve outcomes on a global scale. And that's what I want to discuss with you. Um, and again, I'm, I think I'm waiting for my slides to come up. I'm very disappointed that I can't be there with you in person because I know that there's many interesting conversations I could have with you. I hope my passion for this topic comes through to you loud and clear. And, um, oh, here I am. Okay, so I'm going to start now. Okay, just a moment. The wonderful joys of technology. So I've been following along with the tweets from the conference early, from early this morning, and I hope you'll keep tweeting because it's wonderful for me to be able to follow along that way. So two weeks ago, I delivered the opening keynote at the HIMSS Europe conference, which is one of the largest digital healthcare conferences in the world. And to have a patient delivering the opening keynote was actually seen as something of a novelty. But I wonder why this should be so, because after all, isn't the patient the largest stakeholder in healthcare? And at the conference, I presented a vision of the patient as a change maker, as a disruptor, as a driver of data-driven care. And in some countries, this vision is closer to reality than in others. But as a collective force across the globe, we are stronger together when we unite our voices. And for those countries in which the patient voice is not yet a force to be reckoned with, we have hope that it will be so in the future. And I believe that the igniting force will come from patients themselves. So in my talk today, I want you to forget what you think you know about patients because I'm about to present to you patient 2.0, also known as the e-patient, a phrase that was coined by Dr. Tom Ferguson in his white paper, e-patients, how they can help us heal healthcare. And he used it to describe patients who are empowered and engaged with our care through technology. But before I present this patient to you, I'd like to take you back to HIMSS for a moment. And as so often happens, when I attend digital technology conferences, I am awed by the vision of the future presented to us. But when the exhibitor stands are taken down, when the conference delegates depart, and when I return home, I'm often left with more questions than answers. And I leave feeling that we are on the cusp of a significant step forward in how we diagnose, how we treat, how we manage, and in the future, how we will prevent disease. And indeed, a commonly shared ambition is that a more data-rich, digital approach to healthcare over the next decade will inherently be more patient-focused. But yet, as Dr. Bob Wachter of UCSF pointed out in his HIMSS presentation, we are still at a lamentably early stage in this journey. In fact, he pointed out that we haven't progressed beyond step one of the four stages of health IT. I was shocked when I saw that. In most industries, widespread digitization takes 10 to 15 years, but the complexity of healthcare will lengthen that time frame. But... As we heard from Greg Simon, we cannot afford to wait for healthcare to catch up with other industries, particularly when it comes to accelerating cancer research. My friend, Gilles Friedman, who back in 1995 founded ACOR, the first of the online cancer um, list serves, the Association of Cancer Online Resources, and he calls this the lethal lag time. And while there's widespread recognition that the growth in patient data and the technology that supports it will provide us with the engine we need to drive innovation and to accelerate research, few of us are blind to the challenges ahead. When I was at HIMSS, I picked up a copy of a newly published foresight report by Future Agenda on the future of patient data, and it makes for very interesting reading. It combines insights from multiple expert discussions around the world, and the report highlights shared global concerns, opportunities, and emerging issues. 
Some of the challenges and opportunities are technical in nature, but many, I think, are concerned with different ethical and cultural approaches to health and how we view patients in our society. So I'd like to briefly take you through some of these. So in the first place, the overarching issue of integration is a challenge that we need to overcome to ensure that data can be pulled together from diverse sources. And we are not yet at a point of unleashing data's power in healthcare because the vast majority of information remains proprietary and fragmented. Gilles Friedman, who really has a phrase for everything, calls this data hugging disorder. And in this, he echoes a statement that from the Institute of Medicine that a significant challenge to progress resides in the barriers and restrictions that derive from the treatment of medical care data as a proprietary commodity by the organizations involved. So secondly, ensuring the overall security of personal information is another pressing challenge to overcome. And although trust in institutions is high in countries like Sweden, this is not the case in many other countries where public concern about ulterior motives for the use of data is high. The legal requirements for data protection, such as HIPAA in the US, POPI in South Africa and GDPR in Europe, of course, this is vital. But I believe the issue goes beyond regulation. Without a high level of understanding and trust in the system, patients will not be motivated to share their health data. And so now we come to the question of data access and data ownership. In many countries, and my own country of Ireland unfortunately included, patients do not have access to our own health data. So let's think about this for a moment. In a fragmented healthcare system, which operates to a lesser or greater degree as silos, healthcare includes many touch points. The patient and their family are the only common denominators in the system and the most important touch point. So making the patient the point of data integration has the potential to be profoundly effective and more efficient than current practices. However, even if patients can increasingly access their data, the question of whether we are its real custodians and that we as patients are able to control access to the data varies across borders. And it's increasingly important that we understand who should own health data who should control it, and therefore who is best able to make decisions around its access and use. And this also includes, I think, the reuse of anonymized healthcare data. Once data has been aggregated and de-identified, the game changes. At this point, it can be sold without patient permission, but in my own um, experience, this is something that's not widely recognized. A few years ago, in an interview with Forbes, Tim O'Reilly, who popularized the term Web 2.0, famously said, the guy with the most data wins. Well, then my question is, why shouldn't the patient, who is the guy or the girl, who has the most to win or to lose in healthcare, not own their own data? Over the past few years, we have seen healthcare data expand exponentially, but healthcare is still focused primarily on one source of data. That is data collected by the clinician at the point of care. This ignores the fact that alongside clinical data, the patient data set is expanding with the growing use of self-reported data from blood pressure and heart rate monitors, for example, uh, personal wellness data and proxy data, which ranges from Facebook comments, tweets on Twitter to the Internet of Things. To see the bigger picture about individuals' health, we have to ensure that all data sources are recognized and integrated into the system more rapidly. I think that patient-generated data completes the big data picture of real patients' needs. With social media in particular, we are discovering a more dynamic way to collect patient-reported outcomes in real time. This is powerful. In March this year, JAMA Oncology published research which showed that chemotherapeutic skin reactions were being talked about in online forums six to nine months before they appeared in any of the published literature. And in addition, the study detected a new drug reaction not yet reported on. 
ACOR, which I've just mentioned, actually pioneered data collection within its online cancer communities. Um, for example, reports of kidney toxicity on the ACOR listserv by myeloma patients taking um, Zometa led to experts calling for slowing the infusion time of the drug. That's the power of social media. For those who may be familiar with probably one of the most famous e-patients, e-patient Dave, his story, he's a vocal proponent of patient access to data. You'll know then that he credits the information that he found on ACOR for saving his life when he was diagnosed with stage four kidney cancer. As patients, we are increasingly turning to our peers online, using social media to seek out the experiences of other patients to help guide our healthcare decision making. And at the same time, and this is what I find very exciting, patient-driven data is transforming clinical trials and drug development. We know that too many studies fail to recruit enough patients to be adequately powered, and frighteningly, a subset even fail to recruit any patients. But patient-driven research is changing this. The growing phenomenon of crowdsourcing research allows for access to a large pool of participants, thereby lowering costs and speeding up innovation. And a really great example here is the Metastatic Breast Cancer Project. Launched in 2015, it directly engages patients through social media to share their clinical information and their tumor samples to accelerate research. So powered by social media and peer-to-peer -peer support, we're now seeing a new patient-centered research paradigm, one in which patients are willing and eager to not just participate in research, but to drive it. The project is now expanded to prostate cancer research. And I love to share the example of the MBC project because it means that I can share the story of my friend, Corrie Painter, who is its scientific outreach officer. She's also a cancer survivor who was on her way to earning her PhD in biochemistry when she was diagnosed with angiosarcoma, which is a rare form of cancer that affects just a few hundred people globally each year. And when Kari speaks about her diagnosis, one of the things that she remembers most is searching online for other patients. And she talks about the joy and the hope she experienced when she found eight members of an angiosarcoma Facebook group. Those eight survivors slowly turned into 10, then 20, and today the group continues to grow. And Kari says when people find us now, it actually might change the course of their disease. We've sent so many people to the same doctors that they have become the clinical experts. These doctors now understand nuances of this disease that weren't possible when only a handful of angiosarcoma patients would come through their clinics each year. So as a result, it's the patients that are driving expertise in this rarest of rare orphan cancers. And through her nonprofit, the Angiosarcoma Project, Kari is also accelerating research into this disease and potential treatments. So patients like Kari are driving research because, as I said at the outset, we can't wait for healthcare to catch up. I see this played out every day in the desperate pleas of my friends in the metastatic breast cancer community begging for more research into this disease. Patient stories offer a way for us to see patient data, not as numbers and statistics, but as people with lives and hopes and dreams interrupted by cancer. Stories are what researcher Brene Brown calls data with soul. We connect deeply at the level of stories. Stories are universal across the globe. So I wonder if perhaps a story intervention is where we need to start in low resource settings. We know that stigma is one of the biggest challenges in identifying, reporting and treating um, cancer in developing countries. And when Livestrong ran anti-stigma campaigns in South Africa and South America, the organization sought to reduce stigma through activating culturally relevant stories. I love the fact that when she was asked what she thought had been the most exciting innovation in the connected health era, Susanna Fox, who at the time was chief technology officer of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, said simply, people speaking with each other. And she's right. The simple act of people talking with each other can have profound and far reaching effects, even in a digital age, perhaps especially in a digital age. We're now in a new age of network knowledge, meaning that knowledge, ideas, data, information, wisdom has broken out of its physical confines and now exists in a hyper-connected online state. 
If we can find a way to collect and organize in a more rigorous scientific manner the valuable knowledge that patients and their families are sharing with one another online, we have enormous potential to transform healthcare. So to conclude, to my mind, we are at a Copernican moment in healthcare when everything we believed was true, that the sun revolved around the earth, that humors contained within the human body cause disease, that only magical beings called doctors could understand medical care, is being disproved. Medicine stands at a crossroads unlike any other transformation point in its history. The most powerful force in healthcare transformation is yet to be fully unleashed, and it's not technology. The limiting factor is not access to, to technology, but it's culture change. It's been said that the patient is the most underutilized resource in healthcare. We, the patients, are the ones who can make the biggest difference to changing the system. Our currency is our data, our stories, our experiences, our willingness to reach out and connect with each other and with you. If we can get empirical evidence of what we know, we can align the system in our favor. And that is an amazing opportunity. And it's something I am very hopeful for in the future. So, oh, I've come to an end and I'm back on the big screen again. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marie. So fascinating, a new way to think about all this. You talk about the sort of revolution to collect, to really use this new force that you are talking uh, about. What is needed, do you think? What is the biggest need in order to make this happen? The biggest need, I think, is patients can't do it by ourselves. There's a huge willingness. There is, I can, you can hear me okay? Um, can you hire, yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, super. The biggest challenge is for patients um, that we can't do this by ourselves. We need this partnership. We need industry. We need the medical profession. We need everyone to work together on this. And we're almost perpetuating that healthcare silo thing if it's only patients. I honestly think that patients and what they have been doing over the last decade is revolutionary. But again, we can't do this on our own. We really need that partnership approach. That's what's going to change things. And it's happening in little parts and little pieces, but we still have a long way to go. Technology is very, very exciting. And there's a huge revolution in technology, but I think there's a quieter revolution happening in what patients are doing. And I'm very passionate about getting the word about that out there and organizations and particularly industry working with patients to help them to achieve this. Thank you. Any comments from the audience? Questions while we have Ireland here on? It's like the Eurovision. Yeah. <laughs> 12 points. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Any comments or uh, thoughts or questions? I have another one for you because the internet is full of uh, um, facts, but it's also full of wrong facts or false facts. When this is exploding for the patient, how is it possible to really understand what's right and what's wrong? And this is the one thing that I'm being that I hear so often is how if I go and give these talks, uh, people out of uh, doctors or, or healthcare professionals say, how can I stop my patients Googling? But then they will Google. Patients will Google. This is where we go because there is a lack of the information that we need and we're finding it online. So my answer to that is not how can you stop patients Googling, but how can you start? How can you be that trusted place on the internet so that patients know when they go to their doctor or they go to their healthcare provider, they say, these are the, we know you're going to be Googling, we know you're going to be looking up these information, this is the place that we feel that you, you know, you will get the good information on. So we're back to what I said earlier in the talk, it's a trust factor as well. And at the moment, as patients, we're finding those trusted sources, but we're finding them in other patients. So it's about building that trust again, it's that partnership. We need the healthcare providers to work with us to get the good information out there. And if we get that good information out there, we're going to see less of that poor information. It's, it's going to disappear. I really believe that it will disappear in, within the next decade from the internet. Thank you very much, Marie Ennis O'Connor from Dublin. Thank I you. still give you 12 points. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.